Good afternoon to everyone coming on. We'll just wait a few moments until everybody has um, joined the webinar and then we'll get going. You can see the numbers um, racking up. Right, um, we'll make a start. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our first in the series of our pal palliative care webinars. Um, there's still time to book on to the four other sessions we've got coming up. The timetable's on the screen there for you. Um, it's fantastic to have so many of you with us this afternoon. My name's Charlotte Stevenson. I'm a business development manager at Cardiff University, and our role is to facilitate this type of CPD activity. Just some housekeeping before we get going this afternoon. Um, the chat function is available at the bottom. There's plenty of us here if you want to chat to the team, if you've got any sound problems or anything like that. We've also got the Q&A open there. We'll have um, a Q&A session halfway through the presentation and at the end. So if you've got any questions for Joe or for um, Emily Johns, who will take the GP perspective, pop them in the Q&A and we'll make sure they get answered at the end. Um, we're all working from home, so please bear with us if there's any technical problems, noisy neighbours, etc. Um, that's enough from me. I hand over to our fantastic speaker this afternoon, Dr. Joe Hayes. Over to you, Joe. Hi, so thank you, Charlotte, for the introduction. Um, my name's Dr. Joe Hayes. I'm a consultant in palliative medicine. I'm based at the Marie Curie Hospice in Cardiff, and my clinical job is with the community specialist palliative care team. So out and about seeing patients with palliative and end of life care issues who are either in their own homes or in the nursing and residential homes in our area. Um, I also work for Cardiff University along with my colleagues who are listed there on the screen uh, running the MSc programme in palliative medicine. Um, because we've all got clinical jobs, we are recognising just like everybody else that this winter is looking like it's going to be difficult We've got all of the usual winter pressures, the COVID pandemic, which is uh, never seems to be off our screens and um, a healthcare staff group that are all, all very tired from everything they've dealt with over the year so far. So we were really keen to put on some webinars to try to support all those of you who are out there trying to support palliative care and end of life care patients in the community. Um, I just want to introduce Emily Johns, who's one of my GP colleagues and the Macmillan GP facilitator for palliative care in Cardiff, who may help me to answer some questions a little bit later. And um, we, we put these seminars on, or the webinars on, originally for Cardiff and Vale staff. So there are some things that might be a little bit Cardiff and Vale specific. Everybody else who's booked on is very, very welcome. There just may be a few things that you need to perhaps go and find out about how you do this sort of thing locally. So we've got large numbers of people booked on, which is absolutely fantastic. And I hope that everybody will take a little something away from, from the webinar today that will help them in their, in their daily clinical work. Okay, as Charlotte said, uh, we're going to record the sessions. We will make the slides available and I think there are attendance certificates also for anybody that might need them for their CPD. Okay, so uh, these are the specialist palliative care teams that I work with. They are mainly uh, nursing colleagues in the pictures and the odd doctor, but we also and quite, haven't quite captured them on screen. I also work with uh, therapists, physiotherapists, occupational therapists, social workers and family support team members who do bereavement work. But enough about us, I wanted to ask a little bit about you guys if that's possible. So I'm just going to, if we can, try and run a poll to just ask people what their main role is and the setting that they would normally work in. So I'd be really grateful if you could just click who you are on there for us. And hopefully everybody can see that coming up on the screen, just to give us an idea about who we're talking to. So my husband's a pharmacist, so I'll have to drum up some support from that side. Okay, fantastic. So mainly GPs and GP trainees, there's lots of nursing and AHP colleagues and ambulance service and some members of the palliative care team. Okay, as I said, uh, hopefully a little something for everyone. And if we're able to run the second poll, if that's okay, guys, and just ask people in what setting they're working in.
Thank you. So mainly community, which is no surprise because that's where these, um, this webinar, this particular one was aimed. A fair chunk of people from nursing homes there, which is great. And some of my colleagues from specialist palliative care are also, also listening in. Fantastic. Thank you. I try to close that and see if I can advance my slides. Bear with me. There we are. Okay. So fantastic that so many people have joined us. Um, one of the slight downsides on that is it's difficult to get a sort of small group session going with people able to speak on screen because there's quite a few of us. So if you, I'd be really pleased if people have got lots of questions, please put your questions on the chat function and my colleagues are going to help to monitor that and we will try to build in some time halfway through and at the end to try to answer as many of your questions as we can. Thanks. Okay, so what do we mean by palliative care? Uh, it's an approach that improves the quality of life for patients facing life-threatening illness. So it's about progressive and incurable disease. It often starts early on in a disease journey and it may even start before diagnosis in some cases and continues through and looks after people and their families right to the end at the end of their life and afterwards in terms of bereavement care. It's about holistic care and covers physical, psychological, social and spiritual issues. So end of life care has been defined uh, by the Department of Health in, in the UK and England as concerning those people who are likely to die within the next year or people who are in the last year of their life. So we often think about end of life care as the last few days or the last few hours, but I think it would be helpful if we thought about it in longer terms than that, because that enables us to plan and to think about the future and to talk to patients and their families about what they might want. And then hospice care. Hospices are not about inpatient beds and about the building, but hospice care is a philosophy and a model for the delivery of palliative care that encompasses all of the holistic care that we have talked about. So hospice care will spread across end of life care, palliative care and sometimes beyond. So life threatening illness, what do we mean by that? So palliative care was traditionally about cancer and the first modern hospice started in London in the 1960s by someone called Dame Cicely Saunders who identified that there were lots of patients with cancer for whom there was no further active treatment. And she recognized that they had a lot of unmet need and nobody really trying to help them or to follow them up or to deal with their symptoms. So palliative care traditionally about cancer and then motor neuron disease is another poor prognosis, lots of debility condition, which has traditionally always come under the realms of palliative care. I think within the last maybe 20 years or so, palliative care, we've recognised that there are lots of other life limiting illnesses which are progressive and incurable. And patients with those illnesses have lots of palliative symptom control and unmet need. So I'm talking about failure of all the different systems of your body really, that are common and especially in an ageing population we see an awful lot of. So things like heart failure, the common respiratory chronic conditions like COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and pulmonary fibrosis, and then failure of your other systems, liver failure, renal failure. And then I guess as we all get older, there are lots of diseases of frailty and age that perhaps should come under the palliative care remit. And they are conditions that those of us who work in specialist palliative care haven't dealt very much with but perhaps we should. So things like dementia, MS, Parkinson's, strokes, and general frailty and old age. Okay, we've then got young people and children's palliative care. So children's palliative care is more about chronic conditions, things like metabolic conditions, congenital abnormalities, and things like um, cerebral palsy, so birth injuries. Children do get cancer, but it's rare and fortunately for children who do get cancer they often have quite a good prognosis and hopefully most of them won't have much in the way of palliative and end-of-life care need. And then 
those children that are living with life-limiting conditions that they may have been born with are fortunately again living to an older age, living past the age of 18 and then needing transition into adult services which are often set up very differently from paediatric services and that can be a difficult time for them. So young people with things like Duchenne muscular dystrophy, cerebral palsy, cystic fibrosis and conditions like that. And so they then got COVID, um, which none of us had ever heard about this time last year, if you can imagine. In terms of cause of death, the September 2020 figures are the last ones that I have seen. And in England, COVID then was the 19th most common cause of death and the 24th in Wales. So it's up there in terms of common causes of death, but not the most common and not at the top. I realise that we haven't got October, November and who knows what will happen over the months to come figures. But I guess it's just to focus on, you know, the most common causes of death are still going to be things like cancer, heart disease and frailty. And we need to try our best to make sure that we are meeting the needs of those patients as well in a pandemic. Okay. So how many people die? So apologies for those of you who are joining us from England, but uh, for the map of Wales there, I just wanted you to try to estimate what percentage of the population, and this works for the UK as well, do you think may die within the next year? And I'd be grateful if my colleagues could just launch the poll out there. Okay, great. So the majority of people have said 1% there. Thank you. There's a few going for higher, a few, quite a number going for 5% and some lower. Thanks. So 1%, those of you who picked that are correct. So within a year, in an average UK population, around about 1% of people will die. It's worth thinking about how that might relate to your area. If you're working in the middle of Cardiff, for example, the population tend to be younger and slightly fitter and there's a big student population, so it might be a little bit different. And in some areas of North Wales, where I'm from, there's a big retirement sort of ageing population and then they're going to have different needs and your percentage of people dying could be a bit bigger. But on average, 1%. So about 30,000 people in Wales each year and about four and a half to five thousand in the Cardiff and Vale area for those of you who are working locally. So wh and where are all these people? Where are all the palliative care and end of life care patients cared for do you think? I'm not going to ask you to do another poll. We thought we were, we were uh, pushing it with our poll experimentation. Um, but that's where I work so that's the local hospice in Cardiff the Marie Curie Hospice, which is based out in Penarth. It's got 28 beds, making it the biggest hospice in Wales and actually quite big in UK standards as well. Um, I think the last time I looked at our figures of people dying within the hospice, it was somewhere between three and 400. And I've already told you there's probably four and a half to 5,000 people dying in the Cardiff and Vale area within a year. So actually the number of people we look after towards the end of their life there is quite small. And it's the same for hospices elsewhere. The percentage death rates in hospices are probably about sort of four or five percent and often less of the population. So that's not where all the palliative and end of life care patients are, even though those of us who work in that building and very focused on it think that they are sometimes. So for those of you again who are not local, that's the one of the main teaching hospitals in Cardiff. There's a lot of palliative care patients in there, I can tell you, and lots and lots of work uh, being done by the acute palliative care teams that work there. But hospitals are often not the best place for palliative and end of life care patients. Um, patients are often admitted there for crises, whereas actually if we'd had the right resources or the right people on hand at the time, we might have been able to do something different and not have them end up in hospital. Once they're there, it's difficult to get out. 
And actually, those of you who are from the ambulance service are probably looking at that queue of ambulances outside there, which will all have patients in them waiting to get in. So actually, it's not that difficult even to, it's, sorry, it's not that easy even to get in once you arrive at hospital. So I guess there are palliative care patients in the hospital, but that's not where the majority are. And I would say not where the majority of them should be. So that's one of the nursing homes that's local to us. And there's loads of palliative care going on in nursing and residential homes, loads of really good stuff going on there. And, you know, frail and elderly patients, the vast majority of them are going to have palliative care needs within months or possibly, you know, the first year or two of being there. And we're trying to do lots of work to support nursing homes. And one of these webinars is specifically about nursing homes. So those of you who work in that setting, I really hope you'll join us then and we'll see what we can do to help support. So where are all the patients? So at home, and I would say that most palliative care patients are at home, and home is where generally, if they can be looked after properly, feel comfortable and have the right services, I would say that's where most of them would like to be. Who's looking after patients dying at home? So that's the team that I work with um, and we have got several hundred patients on our books but again I've told you how many thousands there are out there so we're actually looking after a really small number of patients as well those with specialist need but there's an awful lot of palliative care and end-of-life care going on out there that we don't we don't come into contact with and don't know anything about so not them but most community palliative care is being done by non-specialists so families, friends and neighbours. If you live alone and you don't have any family, friends, neighbours or anyone that's able to come in and help look after you, then dying at home is very, very difficult, stroke impossible, because there isn't 24-7 packages of care out there to have somebody with you the whole time. So family, friends and neighbours are doing a, a majority of the looking after out there. GPs are doing palliative care at home all the time. Um, but two thirds of the time is out of hours. So the GP out of hours and primary care out of hours services are picking up lots of stuff. So district nurses, absolute mainstay of palliative care out there in the community and patients would not be able to die at home without them. So I've put community pharmacy in there. Later on, I'm going to talk about the medicines that you might need to enable people to be comfortable if they're dying at home. And they're sort of more complicated medicines um, and injectable medicines that we need and not the usual run of the mill stuff for the chemist down the road. But if you're at home, it's the chemist down the road that you need to use to get your medicine. So you, know, you need to try to help community pharmacy to be able to meet that need. You haven't got easy access to the big shiny pharmacy in the hospital that have got all the medicines and 24 seven cover. So hands on care. For people at home who are dying, often met by care agency staff, um, care home staff, and if you're lucky enough to have it, maybe hospice at home staff. And then the ambulance service are doing lots of palliative care out there in the community because when there's a crisis or when people suddenly become very unwell or when their families panic, and if they're not quite sure who to call, or the people that they do call are not able to respond in a way that they, they perceive as quick enough, then, you know, we've all learned in this country that dialing 999 gets you a response. Often not the best use, best use of uh, resources. The ambulance service are also trying to sort of deal with, you know, everything else out there. But when they do respond to palliative care patients, they do a great job of trying to manage symptoms to do the right thing and to keep people at home if they can and we've done lots of work with the ambulance service in Wales and we'll talk I'll talk a little bit more about that later also. So how do we know when people are in the last 12 months of their life? It can be really difficult to tell and it may depend on how well you know these patients it's very, very difficult if you're me and you sort of get parachuted in to see people you've never met before and their family will look at you and say, well, do you think they're dying? And sometimes it's obvious, but other times it's not. 
So this is one of the tools that we might use to try and identify where the people are in the last, and this says six months, but the last six to 12 months, let's say, of their life. Some of you who are GPs out there, possibly uh, areas other than Wales, will be used to things like gold standards framework that has prognostic indicators that you can try and identify patients that might have palliative care needs. This is a model that's adapted from Scotland and used elsewhere in Wales in Howell Bar down at the bottom there. And it's a series of questions that you can ask yourself to see whether you think your patient might be in the last year of their life or perhaps they should be on your GP palliative care register. So the surprise question, first of all, at the top there, number one, would it be a surprise if this patient died within the next six months? And district nurses, GPs and people that know these patients well can often answer that with a reasonable degree of accuracy. And even though people might surprise us, it's, it wouldn't harm to plan for those people that you think you wouldn't be surprised about. And then you can, if you're not sure, you can think about section two, general clinical indicators. People who are in the bed or in a chair for more than 50% of the day poor performance status, lots of unplanned hospital admissions, multi-morbidities, and those people who are into care home settings may well have palliative care needs and may well be in the last year. Then you can consider section three, so specific disease indicators. If we looked at respiratory disease, for example, so things like COPD, those people who are on long-term oxygen, who are breathless on minimal exertion, who uh, have lots of unplanned admissions for things like infective exacerbations, and on their respiratory function, if they've got things like an FBV1 of less than 30%, then they're the sort of people that might well be in their last six months to 12 months of their life. And I think the difficulty is with things like COPD and heart disease, Healthcare professionals that have been involved with these patients often haven't talked about these illnesses as being sort of progressive or life limiting or that, you know, they, their time might be short for them. It's a little bit different from cancer sometimes and perhaps those patients haven't quite realised that they may need to plan. And so down at the bottom there, if your patients are meeting those criteria, then it's worth trying to talk to them about the future think about their palliative care needs, maybe consider some advanced care planning, put them on your GP palliative care register and review things like their medicines and treatment priorities. Those people are bouncing in and out of hospital all the time and maybe not perceiving much benefit from it. Worth asking them, you know, what, what happens next time you're poorly? Would you like to go back in or actually should we plan to be looking after you at home the next time things aren't so good? just going to talk a little bit about how people die and the, the graphs here. So this is based on a GP list of 2000 patients, which I know all of you out there in primary care are going to tell me it doesn't work like that anymore. We've got big group practices with lots and lots of patients, but it's the same principle as before. Probably about 1% of them are going to die within the next year. So if you look at the, the graphs there, cancer up in the top right hand side, for cancer patients, which will probably be about a quarter of, of your deaths, um, the, the axis on the graph there of function going from high to low. So high function is, you know, walking around, self-caring, mobile, and all of us lot, hopefully. And then it pl plots your progression over time. And with cancer, people often function pretty well for quite a long period of time and then start to decline in a, often in a gradual way. And it depends what cancer you have and how you're responding to treatment. I understand that. Those patients would often decline in a fairly predictable way, in a kind of straight line-ish way there. And so when patients are declining, you can often see what's happening and talk to them about, you know, things are not so good. I think you are getting weaker. I think time might be short and perhaps we should plan a little bit for the future and think about what you might want. Whereas your other patients, the organ failure patients, 
again probably about a quarter or more of them. Over time they are still declining and getting gradually worse but that progression is sort of interrupted by these big dips and they would be things like infective exacerbations of COPD or decompensating heart failure. They're the sort of things that are taking these people into hospital. And often in hospital they will get better, um, not always, but they often don't regain the function that they had before. So when they get out of hospital they're not quite as good as they were when they went in. And then the difficulty with organ failure is that you never quite know in these big dips which one is going to be the one um, that you don't recover from and that leads to the end of your life. So it can be really tricky for these people to plan because you can see them looking very sick. You can do all of your best advanced care planning conversations and feel like you're trying to make some progress with planning their future. And they may well tell you, well, I know I'll get better though. I go back into hospital and, you know, they make me better. So I'm, I'm, I don't want to think about all that stuff and I'm just hoping I'll be okay. And then down at the bottom right hand corner there, we've got probably the majority of patients, depending on the average age on your practice list. Those have got dementia, frailty and decline. We've got pretty low function perhaps to start with and that sort of bounce along the bottom there. And it's really difficult to predict actually when the end of their life is because they, they don't have particularly great function anyway, but can often surprise us and be with us for much longer than we think. I guess these are the sorts of patients that might be um, in nursing homes or residential homes or might be at home but only managing at home because they've got quite significant care packages. So it's important to try and understand a little bit about those trajectories, just know how the future is going to pan out for some of these patients and to be able to talk to them and their families about what to expect. Um, where do people want to die? So most people, well, if you ask them when they're relatively fit and well and young and haven't really thought about it very much, would say that they would like to be at home. Um, often they would change their mind if they didn't have adequate support. And once people start to become unwell and recognise the reality of being unwell, then the people opting for things like hospice care rises as as the final weeks and days uh, draw near. Where do people actually die? So we've already said that most would want to die at home. The figures down there on the right hand side are span around about 10 years. Um, some of them are Wales and some of them are England. So they may not be directly comparable, but they're just giving us an idea there. So most people are dying in hospital, the vast majority. It may be that that's reducing a little bit. That's where people end up in crisis and often don't get out again. The percentages of people dying at home there are not changing enormously. They're hovering around about the 20% mark. Numbers of people dying in care homes, again, give or take a few percentage points, are staying roughly the same. There is a bit of an increase in people dying in care homes and I think that's because care home staff with some support are getting much, much better at managing end of life care and so less people are less likely to end up in hospital because there's been a crisis or they've deteriorated in their care home and been admitted. I think there's less likelihood to admit those people and to recognise dying and look after them where they are. Um, as I said, tiny percentages of people in hospices. So we've got an ageing population, the baby boomers are all getting older and there's going to be, I'm afraid to say, a COVID aside even, lots, lots more dying in the decades to come. There's not going to be lots more hospital beds to accommodate those people. It's unlikely there's going to be lots more hospice beds and probably unlikely there's going to be large numbers of more care home beds either. So actually we, we absolutely have to expand the numbers of people dying at home because we've got no other choice. So that means we need to support them adequately, educate people and put all the services in place that we might need to enable that to happen. Okay, um, I've talked a lot already it feels like so I'm going to stop there for a minute. I can't see the chat from where I am so I'm going to hand over to my colleagues if that's okay to ask me any questions that you think might be uh, 
important to answer at this point, if that's okay. We haven't had any questions in the, in the Q&A just yet, Joe. So if anybody okay. wants to quickly type something in, I can ask Joe that right now, or we have got the, the section at the end as well. So if you want the answer at the end, type it in, in a few minutes time. If there's anything you want answered right now, you quickly pop it in, we'll get Joe to answer that. I think I've probably talked everyone into submission. <laughs> I'm going to stop sharing my screen for a minute and just sort the next bit out. Uh, no questions still, so it's maybe it's best to, to crack on because I know we're, we're quite pushed for time, Jo. Okay. So while people are having a think, I'm just going to leave this, this uh, slide on for two or three minutes for people to just have a think about this particular patient, this particular case. So if any of you local who work with me, it's not a, he's not a real patient. He's someone that's an amalgamation of patients that I've seen over the last few months. Um, I'm just going to think about what this gentleman at home might need, how to sort those things out that he might need, what to do with his medicines, what sort of services might be useful. So he's 70, he's got COPD, ischemic heart disease and diabetes. He's also got cancer, diagnosed a good few months ago and has been treated with palliative chemotherapy. So at the start of this year, his disease had progressed with the chemotherapy and uh, he believes that his chemo was stopped due to the pandemic because he was called in and told that uh, the treatment wasn't really working and that you know, hospitals were about to become overrun with COVID patients and they were probably a place to avoid at the moment and that his, his specialist thought it was a good time to have a, have a treatment break. Shortly after that, he was admitted to hospital with shortness of breath, cough, general deterioration. He was treated with IV antibiotics, but whilst he was there, swabbed positive for COVID, which he hadn't when he went in, and insisted on discharge at this point. He was very upset that he couldn't see his family and they were upset as well and the IV antibiotics didn't particularly seem to be working. So at home he, he was and this was quite a rapidly set up discharge so may not have had all the services that he might have needed in place at the time. He started to find it difficult to take his medicines and overnight became very agitated, had a fall, was seen by the ambulance service um, and district nurses, given midazolam several times with very little effect. He was looking very distressed, so was his wife, and oxygen saturations were found to be only 75% on air. I've listed his medicines there, Zomorph is the same thing as MST, fairly typical things there that you might be on with his comorbidities, and he's had midazolam. Um, four times we've said overnight with little effect. So have a quick think about that patient, maybe jot down a couple of things that you might think about if you were a team member looking after him, what would you do in your usual role? Then I'm going to go on and talk a little bit about him specifically towards the end, but to start off with patients like him and what they might need out there in the community in those sorts of situations. Okay, so assessment. First of all, I know you've all got different roles out there. How, how are you going to assess this gentleman? In what media are you going to use? Are you going to see him face to face, virtual, telephone, use someone else, do it by the district nurses? What, what do you think? He's got his tested positive for COVID, remember? <laughs> Okay, so we've got just under half people doing a face-to-face -face assessment. 
we've got video consultation and telephone for the other chunk via the district nurses and I guess you know that's um, I was quite surprised actually that's quite a small percentage because they are other healthcare professionals that have already been there overnight and would be able to give you a proxy face-to-face -face assessment and the asking palliative care to assess um, yeah we, we get lots of phone calls to go and see people like this and in an ideal world would have been referred him before he was being discharged from hospital. I have to say I think I would prefer to assess him face to face if that was at all possible. Um, I've been to see patients like this out in the community and it's very tricky to assess virtually um, but I realise we've all got to weigh up the risks and benefits and how many healthcare professionals are in there and I'm not sure there's a particularly right answer um, but it's 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 tricky to do it not face to face I think. Thank you. So place the situation in a longer context this is patients generally and not specifically about the gentleman that I told you about. Um, if people were very well two days early and earlier and zipping around Tesco's doing their shopping and then suddenly look really really unwell um, that's an acute deterioration and potentially there could be a reversible cause and I think you would be looking harder for a reversible cause for somebody that was well the day before or the day before that whereas if you're getting a history from patients or from their families that actually you know, we know that the cancer spread, he's gradually got weaker over the last month or so. Every day he's doing a little bit less and sleeping a little bit more. And that suggests that there really isn't anything acute going on. And it's probably you know, more likely to be gradual disease progression with no easily reversible cause. So what do you know about what your patients might want if they've deteriorated? What are their wishes around future care? Would they want to consider um, going back into hospital? Would they want to consider the sort of treatments that you can only have in hospital? Or have they made it very clear that they wish to stay at home? And often if you ask, people will make their wishes clear. And then communication, we haven't got time to go into the intricacies of communication skills today, um, but these are difficult conversations sometimes to have, made even more difficult by those of you who elected to see this patient face to face because you're going to be dressed something like the lady at the top there with your mask and your visor and your apron and everything else or you're on a video screen with his wife sort of waving her mobile phone face or you're going to be trying to assess things over the phone so assessment these days is even more difficult than usual so in the next slide, I'm just going to play a two minute, I promise you it's only two minute video about communication, if it works, cross fingers. So we're going to talk a little bit today about some of the difficulties that we're all as health professionals going to face during this time of the COVID-19 pandemic. Unfortunately, many of us are going to experience many of our patients who will be elderly and have multiple comorbidities dying during this time. Communication is really important when we're looking after patients who are this sick or who are dying. But we're going to have lots and lots of barriers to communication that are going to make it really difficult. The things that we're going to have to face and get around is going to be wearing PPE, a face mask, a better apron, gloves, a visor. All those things make it really difficult to talk to a patient. But there are ways that we can get around these things and still show that we care and that we have compassion for every single person. So the first thing I would suggest is to remember the power of eye to eye contact because we can show that we care by looking at a patient. We can show that we feel connected to them um, by looking into their eyes. Second thing I would suggest is your tone of voice. If we can keep it gentle and kind, it makes a huge difference to a patient, just speaking slowly and gently. Third thing I would suggest is coming down to their level. If you stand over a patient who's feeling isolated and frightened, it makes them even more so. So just take a chair, sit down next to them or crouch down. Just to be at their level makes a huge difference. Fourth thing, 
is you can still take their hand even though you're wearing a glove and have that little bit of physical contact can bring great comfort. Fifth thing, keep language simple. Speak in short sentences and give a chance between things that you're communicating to your patient for, for silence. Try and be comfortable with that silence because that's the time when the patient is absorbing what you're saying to them. So overall, if we just take these simple steps, we can make a huge difference to the experience of every single patient at this incredibly difficult time. So we'll talk a little bit today about... Okay, so I hope you've all been able to hear that okay. And it's just some tips really um, about how to communicate when you're covered in layers of plastic, which I'm sure we've all um, created our own tips over the last few months. So back to our patient, is he dying? I think he probably is, and I've written this as somebody who's probably towards the end of his life. He's got multiple comorbidities. He's got progressive cancer. He's got COVID. He is very agitated in a way that could easily be terminal agitation. And he's got oxygen saturations of 75% on air to go with his um, COVID, COPD and cancer diagnosis affecting his lungs. So I think the way we have written this scenario is this person's probably dying and we perhaps need to acknowledge that and plan for that. It's likely that time is pretty short for him. But how do we diagnose dying? It is really difficult. It can be very difficult. It sort of depends on how well you know the patient. It sort of depends on how much you know about their medical condition. And often you are relying on people like relatives to describe those trajectories that I, I showed you in the earlier slides. So NICE guidance suggests that you can diagnose dying if you've got mottled skin and chain stokes breathing, which to be honest, I think we could probably all diagnose dying if we can see those things happening in a patient. Uh, so that's not hugely helpful. Increasing fatigue, well, that you know, could be me at the end of a difficult week in work. That's not very specific. Um, social withdrawal, that's all of us with several months of lockdown, isn't it? Um, and not, um, nice guidance suggests that there's not enough evidence to recommend tools which predict prognosis. So I don't think that's particularly helpful. Um, pragmatic approach that I and my colleagues in palliative care use all the time is describing the trajectories, really. If you're deteriorating month by month, then your prognosis might be in terms of months. On the other hand, if you're deteriorating each week, it could well be in terms of weeks. And actually, if we've reached the point where every day things are different, then it might be that time is now in terms of days. This works better if you're on the straight line bit of the cancer graph or the straight line bit of the organ failure graph and not in one of those big dips but it's a useful sort of approach that I use all the time and it's come from uh, someone called Robert Twycross, just to reference him there. So the sort of challenges in the terminal phase of illness for people who are at home. So their functional decline, their inability to get up, move around and look after themselves causes, causes most of the issues and most of the reasons why they might need help. So it often needs special equipment like hospital beds, commodes, our district nursing colleagues and allied health professional colleagues are really important people to help us with that. So we're lucky enough to have access to OT, physio and social work colleagues within the hospice. But in the community, there are community therapists and, as you know, community social workers that can try and help to organise all of this stuff. Um, Hands-on care is often what people need the most. They don't necessarily need the highly specialist qualified doctors and specialist nurses quite so much. They often need practical hands-on care. So things like agency carers, or if you're lucky enough, hospice at home. Um, not eating and drinking. We, we wouldn't usually, for people dying in the community, think about artificial fluids or artificial feeding, but it's a prime concern for patients and even more so their families. So it's we just need to address those things, talk it through with families that actually time is short, people's needs for food and fluid are, are much less. Um, it's not something we're able to do at home and we've already said that you know you don't want to go back to hospital 
and actually putting fluids up at this point wouldn't be helpful and might actually make uh, breathing more difficult and more bubbly at this point. So it's just going through those sorts of explanations. And people who are dying often can't swallow their medicines and you need another route for medicines that are important. Okay, so we often use syringe drivers, which is safe and reliable and can either deliver um, regular medicines as a continuous infusion, or you can use a subcut route for um, breakthrough medication. But not every patient needs a syringe, not every dying patient needs a syringe driver. There's no law that says you have to die attached to a syringe driver. Advanced care planning, I'm not going to go through this in detail, but um, if you go to see somebody in crisis as an out of hours GP or an ambulance service staff, for example, um, it, you're always very, very pleased if you see any advanced care planning documents at home because it means that someone has tried to plan ahead and it will guide you with what to do in a crisis. So where do you want to be looked after? Are there any important things that you want taken into account? Who can speak on your behalf? What about practical matters? Um, the green little pot up there is uh, one of the Rotary Club message in a bottle. So those people that would like to plan ahead can put important information in that container. It lives in the door of the fridge because everyone's got a fridge. And uh, the ambulance colleagues that I speak with in, in Wales are well aware of this and go looking for these things. So DNA CPR, um, useful to get done in case anybody uh, tries to resuscitate patients who are dying inappropriately. It's guidance only though, really useful guidance, but isn't legally binding. It's a medical decision and best taken in context with all of the other discussions that you're having. I think if you go in to speak to patients sort of cold and say, would you like to be resuscitated? It's, it's gonna turn into a difficult conversation because people's automatic reaction is perhaps to say yes, and not really understanding the context not really understanding that actually it's only an important decision if your heart has actually stopped beating. And in that context, you know, would you really want someone to try to bring you back? when well, it's very, very unlikely to be successful, will be distressing and not only for you, but your family around you and actually the staff that, that need to carry that out. Decisions need to be valid to the situation. And if you read the Resuscitation Council, um, RCN and BMA, I think, joint guidance, healthcare professionals can make an assessment at the time and make a different decision if they can justify that in terms of their assessment. So that means if someone's got a DNA CPR form but they're choking, for example, you can decide that actually that wasn't made with that situation in mind and I'm going to go ahead and resuscitate them. Whereas if someone is clearly dying from an advanced illness, but no one's got around to writing the form and they've deteriorated, deteriorated, and, and now they're towards the end of their life, you may well be confident enough to make a decision as a healthcare professional that resuscitating them is not appropriate, even though there's no form there. There's just some resources there from my colleagues at talkcpr.com that's useful to look at for those of you who are interested. Okay, I'm just having a look at our time. So we'll share these slides. I'm going to go through these very quickly, but we're recording the session and we'll share the slides with you for you to have a little look at in your own time. Pain is common. Um, towards the end of life, only do the investigations that are doable and that might help. Patches we tend to leave on and add subcut medicines if needed. Got our analgesic ladder there. Remember patients who are on strong cocodamol at maximum doses, the equivalent of that is about 15 twice a day of MST or Zomorph. If you start lower, people's pain might be worse because you've actually reduced their equivalent doses. So shortness of breath, um, we open the windows, reassure people, try and do some breathing techniques. Um, outside of COVID, fans are really useful. With COVID, they're not recommended because they can help to aerosol generate. And our mainstay of medicines for breathlessness would be morphine, benzodiazepines such as lorazepam and midazolam. And oxygen's unlikely to be helpful and less hypoxic. And even then, it's more important to treat symptoms with things like morphine and oxygen can become a barrier and logistically quite difficult to organise in an emergency in the community also. There are rapid guidelines for managing symptoms at end of life in COVID in the community and worth a look for those of you who think you might uh, be dealing with patients like this over the winter.
agitation and delirium again, um, we use medicines like levomipromazine, midazolam, haloperidol, and strike a balance between alertness and comfort. The gentleman that I told you about was very agitated and is probably going to need sedation in order to die in a comfortable way. Death rattle or increased respiratory secretions. We use medicines like hyacin, hydrobromide, buscopan or glycopuronium. Um, they're often not that effective, especially if they're started late. And actually, it's much more important to reassure families um, that it's often just a noise in the back of the throat that patients look like they're not really not aware of a lot of the time. It's often because they're deeply unconscious. And positioning can help. Sitting people up or putting them over onto their side can be really useful. In inpatient settings, suction, a little bit of gentle suction is sometimes helpful, um, not for COVID and often not available in the community. Okay. So medicines, uh, we need anticipatory injectable medicines for end of life care for people who are dying, for things like pain, breathlessness, agitation, nausea and vomiting and secretions, as I've said. They need to be uh, prescribed on a chart in most, most community settings that I have worked in. Check the options. Uh, this is what's in Cardiff. I, this is a document in Cardiff that will tell you how to access medicines in community settings. If you work in Cardiff and haven't seen it, I would read it. it tells you where all the chemists are, what time they're open, gives you numbers, including mobile numbers, and gives you a list of the medicines that they hold. I won't go over this flowchart in any great detail. Um, but that tells you what to do if the chemists are not shut or they haven't got what you want and in the end can access medicines via hospitals where we work. For those of you who are working elsewhere, you need to check out what your local arrangements are. GEMP, just-in-time emergency medicine packs, are something that is a COVID um, service set up at the beginning of this year, a single point of access where you can deliver this little group of medicines at the bottom there to anybody anywhere in Wales um, with a time scale of one to two hours and has been really successful. So you can, if you can't get medicines from elsewhere through the usual channels, you can write a prescription, you can hospify it, which means it's like WhatsApp. You take a photo of it and send it securely to a health courier service. And a guy like Dave here that was very perturbed at me taking his picture will come and uh, pick up your prescription and deliver medicines to patients. Very quick uh, look at the ambulance service in Wales, another COVID initiative. They have got just in case end of life care medicines on every ambulance, which allow paramedics to administer the medicines for symptoms like breathlessness, anxiety and agitation. If you have a look up there, um, about half and half medicines were given in own homes or care homes. Most of them were given for people with either cancer or frailty and dementia and hardly any for COVID. And most of the medicines given were things like midazolam rather than opioids. So what do patients need when they're dying at home? Well, all of those things really, family specialist advice, hands-on care, primary care team and some medicines, some equipment and, uh, and a few bits of paper. And what I haven't put there are all of the different people who might be involved. So we're just going to do our last poll, if that's OK, and just to give us an idea, what's the most difficult thing about managing patients at home? Thank you. I think I would agree with that. Organising care, um, as nearly half of you have said that, and I think I would find that the most difficult. Sometimes medicines are difficult. Um, I hope that palliative care teams are accessible, but I, I completely appreciate out of hours that can be tricky. And I guess that discussing the difficult issues is just something that... Um, it is not supposed to be easy, is it? Because it's difficult stuff. Um, but 
that you know there are techniques and communication type strategies that you can have a think about to help you with that. So quickly for our patient, what are we going to do with his medicines, the Zomorph and the Haloperidol or an alternative, we're probably going to put in the syringe driver. I think we're going to stop the laxative, the aspirin, the statin. I think everyone on the world's on the statin. The bisoprolol, probably going to stop. It depends why he's on it. The steroids, we're probably going to stop. Certainly if he's clearly dying and can't swallow. And the insulin, we are probably going to stop. He's type 2 and he's not on a huge amount of insulin. If he was a type 1 patient or on large amounts of insulin or wasn't clearly dying, then we'd probably take diabetic specialist advice. So syringe driver, this is the sort of thing that I might put in a syringe driver for this gentleman. He was on 20 milligrams twice a day of morphine. So the equivalent of that is 20 milligrams over 24 hours. I've increased that because he was very distressed and breathless and had lots of respiratory symptoms. And we use morphine for breathlessness as well as pain. We've put in a reasonable dose of midazolam there because he was very agitated. And I've also added in some levomipromazine again for agitation. Agitation and delirium are common symptoms in COVID and the, and the starting doses of sedatives are a little bit higher for those sorts of patients. It's really important to prescribe as required medicines there on the right hand side so that people like um, district nursing staff who are visiting can give top ups of medicines if needed. Okay. And dying people and their families need a bereavement follow-up. There are specific COVID issues about delays or perceived delays to usual healthcare, visiting restrictions, people dying alone, reduced face-to-face -face interactions and isolation for the people left behind, and the ability to have inability to have the sort of funerals that they might have wanted. So um, it's worth finding out about what your bereavement services are locally for your families. Uh, and there they are us and how to access our local services, which I hope everybody knows. And there's some useful resources there. Okay, so I'm going to stop there. I think we are almost at the end of our hour, but I'm very happy to try and answer any questions if anybody has them. Thanks, John. I'll read out a couple of questions. I think there may be a bit of an echo with the presentation in the background. Um, hi Joe, a general question but just wondered whether your opinion is of referral criteria for specialist palliative care given what you've said about the small, oh, I've lost that, small proportion overall dying patients by your team. Um, so I guess that people are saying should our referral criteria be wider so we pick up more people, I think that might be what's being asked. Um, I can only speak for our team. I guess we don't have very strict referral criteria and are very happy to discuss any patients and have a conversation over the phone and even if we don't see them to advise or to give you things that might be helpful and then for you to come back to us if needed. I guess specialist palliative care and the numbers of people working in specialist palliative care are reasonably small. So we are, the way things are set up at the moment, only going to physically see and manage um, you know the, the people with specialist need but very happy to advise on the others very happy to talk through patients and I guess in doing things like education and research and um, influencing services strategically we're also trying to sort of throw the net wider in that way okay Thanks, Joe. Um, um, so what do you feel as a bigger barrier using home place of care and place of death? And how can we come together towards making home a more viable option for patients and families? Um, I guess it's all of those things that I have said, isn't it? The need for all of this lot. Um, if I'm sharing my screen okay there, let's have a look. Yeah. Um, I think hands-on care at home is often uh, one of the biggest barriers. So actually organising physical people to come in and look after somebody um, and getting that done in a timely manner is often is the thing that I find the most difficult, I think. 
Um, so how we can work together, I guess it's about all of us having a conversation about how to focus the palliative care resource, isn't it? So, you know, we could um, create more palliative care consultants, but they're quite expensive and they don't do the hands-on care. So you might well say that you would want more of something like a hospice at home type service with people that can come in and help. And there does need to be um, a, an alternative to home for patients to be able to be at the end of their life. Not everybody wants to be at home. Lots of people don't have any family or friends around and 24 seven care realistically isn't going to be available. Um, and some people have really difficult symptoms and specialist needs. So there is going to need to be alternative places. Um, another question, were the statistics representative of all deaths or palliative deaths? I think this goes back to this, the stats you had probably at the start of the presentation. Um, so they were all deaths. I think they're probably talking about the stats which said where people died. So about 20% of people at home and 60% in hospital. So they were all deaths. And the, the numbers are changing a little bit. Hospital deaths are going down a bit. Home deaths are going up a bit. And care home deaths are going up a bit. Um, as I said, I don't think there's huge numbers more places in care homes. I think that's just because they're getting better at looking after the people that they have got. Um, but that, yeah, that was, that was all deaths. Um, are you able to signpost any useful resources, re-insulin, BM monitoring in EOLC, please? Well, okay. Um, there's a document from Diabetes UK. I think if you Google Diabetes UK end of life care, brings you a great document which is long but has got lots of pretty graphs and pretty colours and flowcharts in um, that will tell you how to manage diabetes towards the end of life and it depends where the people are in the last few months, last few weeks or last few days and then have a look at your local resources. So I know that in Cardiff there are community specialist diabetic nurses that I have only, uh, have only in post and I've only been dealing with in the last couple of months. So you might well have the equivalent where you work. We've got a couple of similar questions from paramedics. Um, how do you begin conversations with patients and family about palliative care if they're not expecting it? There have been to several patients who would benefit from palliative care but didn't realise the patient were nearing the end of life. Um, I guess it's, it's more listening really. So open questions, looking for the clues around you. So, you know, when people are they've got um, houses full of equipment and they're attached to oxygen and they might have a district nursing folder with a DNA CPR form in it, then you know, there's, there's lots of clues that they might be patients with palliative need. How to bring it up, I guess, and we've done loads of communication skills training with uh, WAST staff, so the Ambulance Service in Wales, so it'd be interesting to know yeah, which, which country that person's coming from. Um, it's about asking open questions, sort of saying um, things like, you know, how, how can we help today? Has this happened to you before? When you've been in hospital before, how has it gone? You know, would, would you like to try and manage things in a different way? Is anybody else involved with you in the community? Do you see your district nurses? Do you see your GP? Um, have you talked about future care plans? Sort of those sorts of things. Um, but it is, it is difficult, it's especially difficult if you're ambulance service staff who are parachuted in in a crisis and have never met that patient before and often have very little information when they're on the call and um, it is hard for them and that's why we've tried to do lots of comm skills training in Wales. Um, we, we've got quite a few questions but I know we're short on time so I'll try and pick out some um, and Emily do come in if you've got um, any perspective here you want to jump in. Um, can you expand on that, uh, on that medicines delivery service and um, they weren't aware of that? Okay, um, so the GEMP scheme, uh, it depends whether they're in Wales or not, it's a Wales only scheme. Um, it, it was for COVID, it's about delivering a set box of drugs which will, uh, will enable you to address symptoms when people are dying and it's about getting them to that patient within a couple of hours anywhere in Wales. So it was set up during the start of this year. Um, it's clever really because you can write a prescription and you don't, usually with controlled drugs, you then have to deliver that actual piece of paper to a chemist and get things dispensed. Whereas the way the GEMP scheme is set up, you take a photo of your prescription um, and Hospify is just an app, which is the same as WhatsApp. 
but a secure clinical channel. You send your photo to the health courier service and they take the medicines to the patient. Um, the link to the service is on the slide actually, so if you're going to share the slides, there's a, a link to the website, which is the All Wales Therapeutic Centre website, which tells you exactly how to, how to do that. Okay, we'll, we'll do two more because I know we've, we've run over and we're losing a few people here. Um, somebody was wondering what your referral criteria was. Um, so we don't have particularly tight criteria, I have to say. It's patients with progressive um, life-limiting illness, um, things like uh, symptoms or in need of psychological support, and I guess symptoms that are more in the specialist realm, um, you know, rather than those that could be quite easily dealt with within primary care. Um, or within other hospital settings if we're talking about secondary care. So we haven't got very strict criteria written down actually. Um, and we sort of take in all referrals and if we feel that we need to go back and discuss those with the referrer then we do that. I don't know, Emily, do you want to comment at all on referral to palliative care because you're coming from a GP perspective? Um, I suppose if you've got any patients that have got more complex needs or any symptoms that you're struggling to manage yourself, then obviously um, specialist palliative care is needed. Um, we were talking a bit earlier on about um, the prognostic indicators and, you know, sort of frailty and things. Obviously, if you've identified people as being um, frail and you've coded them on your palliative care register, that doesn't necessarily mean they instantly need a referral into specialist palliative care, um, but it could just be a little trigger for you to think about, um, you know, some future care planning. Um, and then if problems did arise further down the line with difficulties in symptoms or, um, you know, complex, complex issues, then um, a referral to the team would probably be indicated then. Brilliant. Last question. As a newly qualified OT who hasn't worked a lot yet with palliative patients, how can I best support patients to engage with their therapy and rehab when they're, when they're aware they're on a palliative end of life care? How can I best ensure their comfort when engaging with them in therapy? Any advice is appreciated. I guess um, ensuring their comfort is hopefully they have uh, had their symptoms as well controlled as possible and if things like pain and nausea and breathlessness are as well controlled as they can be then that would help them to engage with their therapy. Um, I guess even though patients might be palliative and might have a limited prognosis their therapists have absolutely loads to offer in maximising um, what function they have got and what potential they have got. So my therapist colleagues um, who work in the hospice and out in the community with us frequently help people to achieve um, things that they, they didn't feel they would be able to sort of improve mobility or to provide them with special equipment so they're much more capable of looking after themselves at home. So it's about um, helping them to make the most of the function and the goals that they do have. Fantastic. Um, I think we'll sort of end the session there. Um, jo, Emily, have you got anything else you want to say in conclusion? Just thank you all for attending. It's lovely to see so many of you interested and wanting to learn more about palliative care. Yeah, thank you so much for your time. Sorry we've run over a bit. Please, please fill in your evaluation forms because that would uh, give us a case for talking to the university about further sessions like this. And I hope you've all gained something from this afternoon. Fantastic. Thank you all for attending and thanks to Joe and Emily for their time this afternoon. Um, I hope you've all got a lot out of that. And as Joe said, please complete the evaluation when we circulate it because it will give us some momentum to put more um, free events like this one. Thank you all. Take care.